This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. We asked the question, what would be the most awkward dinnertime conversation? And next to sex... Money and parents' finances were like a close second. So the conversations aren't happening, but it's something that really will impact both generations, both the generation of people living in the 100s and the generation that's supporting them that's younger. Hello again and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Now, one of the most common questions I hear related to lifespan is... What if we run out of money as we get older? And if we live a a very long, healthy, active life, will we be able to afford the kind of lifestyle that we aspire to? It's all very well imagining that 100th birthday as surely more and more of us will experience in the future. But if it also comes with economic hardship and uncertainty, the joy of achieving a great health span may not be so great after all. We're going to discuss that today and also meet our new sponsor. I'm very pleased to say that over the next few months, Llama podcast episodes will be brought to you in association with Age Up, a new product that addresses this very issue and how to ensure that you or your parents have guaranteed supplemental income if you or they live an exceptionally long life. We're going to delve into the world of finance. I'm joined by the founder and general manager of Age Up, Blair Baldwin. Blair, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Oh, thank you, Peter, for having me. It's great to talk to you. This episode is a little different to most. I wanted to spend some time learning more about Age Up since we're entering into this relationship over the next few weeks and months. Sponsorship is hugely important to this podcast to ensure our longevity. And uh, I'm very happy that we're doing this. Same here. It seems like such a perfect match. Uh, A longevity, new type of longevity product with a longevity podcast. It's perfect. Well, before we delve into the issues and before we delve into longevity annuities, tell me about your own personal background and, and how you got into this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's a, it's a great story also. Um, and I will say that uh, I'm relatively new to the world of longevity and the issues surrounding it. Uh, I'm a really a startup guy by background. A few years ago, I founded a, a, an insurance startup that then was acquired by one of these very large sort of reputable insurance carriers. And they, they gave us this fascinating challenge They said, recreate or reimagine what you could do with annuities with almost no constraints. Really, the only constraints being make something that's digital, that's financially accessible to everybody, and that does a little good for the world, that solves some meaningful problem. Now, I want to say I realize that the word annuities is a little charged. And for some people, it's going to make their eyes roll. And for other people, it's going to make their eyes frankly, close and go to sleep. So I promise you that I will not spend a lot of time talking about annuities and the word annuity. But I do want to talk about sort of longevity and the interesting financial product that we developed along the way. So going back to sort of when we got acquired by by this very large, reputable insurance carrier, uh, Mass Mutual, and their startup subsidiary, Haven Life, they gave us this open-ended challenge around sort of annuities. And We really didn't know anything about annuities, which was a good thing because it gave us a completely blank slate to work with. And so, you know, we tried to understand these very complex products and really boil them down to their, to their essence. And one of the things that they are marketed as is uh, longevity protection. And we kind of picked up that thread and started playing with it and seeing where it went. And one of the first places that it went is it actually, while they do sort of provide longevity protection in a way, the definition of longevity is something that probably wouldn't resonate with your audience. Most annuities are sold to people in their you know, 50s, 60s, early 70s. And the latest you can annuitize the product is, is usually about 85 years old, which in today's day and age is actually not a very long lifespan or, or health span. So that was sort of one thread. The other thread that we started going down, which relates to to longevity, is we started looking at sort of all these kind of wacky, interesting products from the past that uh, that sort of are related to annuities and what we could learn from them. 
And, and one of the products that we looked at that was just really inspiring is something called a, a tontine. I, I don't know, if, have you ever heard of, of, of this product? I have not. Tell me. Oh, this is fantastic. And Peter, if you ever want to go down a Wikipedia click hole, Google tontine. A tontine is this fascinating financial instrument that was invented in Italy in the 17th century. And think of it as kind of like a, like a longevity lottery. So you have a bunch of people who put in some money, usually to one of the kind of the monarchies of, of Europe at the time. Uh, this was what was used to fund sort of wars, essentially, and conquests. And what would happen is every year that monarchy would sort of pay out a dividend to the people that were still alive in the original Tontine. And so if you think about it, as uh, time goes on and more and more people sort of die and sort of uh, pass, the payout gets larger and larger. And so what you end up having is a financial product that really rewards the folks that live a very, very long life disproportionately. And it's in a lot of ways like true uh, longevity insurance. And that was just really inspiring to us. And we asked the question, like, well, you know, why, why can't we do something like that? In a lot of ways, uh, Peter, it's, it's almost the inverse of term life insurance. And so if you think about term life insurance, you pay a little bit of money into a pot and it's protection in case you uh, pass earlier than expected so that your family is, you know, is, is not left holding the bag. And this uh, operates in the opposite way. And so that was kind of the inspiration. Like, let's, let's sort of take inspiration from this, this concept of a tontine and this concept of almost the inverse of life insurance and, and try to build a product. Now, there's a problem, of course, which is that the tontine is really illegal. Um, what ended up happening is that this financial product, two-thirds of all insurance in the United States, actually, at the turn of the 20th century, was a tontine. Everybody was buying these things and selling these things, and it was just rife with... Um, kind of a scandal and misappropriation of funds. And so the government banned them. So you can't actually do that. However, we, we were inspired by the concept and we used some of the same principles to develop this new financial product, Age Up, which is really geared towards the sort of long tail of longevity. People that are living into their mid-90s, 100, and a way to take small dollars and buy something that functions and looks a lot like insurance, although it's an annuity, just to be very clear, that starts paying out very late in life at a time when you likely will have exhausted your money and actually may need the resources. Well, I'd like to, to delve into all of that in some detail and, and really sort of figure out and try to understand how it works, how it could work for me, how it mm -hmm. could work for many people who are beginning to address that phase in their lives. And, and that's where I'd like to go now in terms of perhaps some of the market research that you might have done, because I know, I think everyone accepts that talking about money and talking about money associated with getting older is sometimes just a very difficult conversation because oftentimes you're not talking about your own money. You might be talking about the money and the resources of your loved ones. Mm -hmm. And some people just don't want to think about it and, and feel nervous. And they almost think it's, it's a morbid conversation to talk about what will be going on very late in life. Have you looked into that? You know, we have. And, and one of the fascinating things about um, the sort of late in life finance is that it really is a multi-generational issue. Um, and so we surveyed a, a couple of times people in their late 50s, 60s and early 70s and asked them questions like, you know, if you were to live to 100, how would you support yourself financially? And as it turns out, uh, the number one answer is actually their family. I think about 43%. Uh, the government, surprisingly, is only about 23% of people said that the government would be their, their primary means of support. Now, what's really interesting is you then sort of look at the children of that generation, which we've also surveyed extensively. And while they expect to financially support their, uh, their parents, uh, the majority do, it's interesting because these conversations aren't happening. So most, most adult children in their 30s and 40s never speak to their parents about money. In fact, we asked the question, in terms of awkwardness, what would be sort of the, the most awkward dinnertime conversation? And next to sex, money and parents' finances were like a close second. So the conversations aren't happening, but it's something that really will impact both generations, both the generation of people in living into their 100s and the generation that's supporting them that's younger. So it's, it's a great point. 
So let's uh, talk the process through then. Uh, at what age should we, do you think, be thinking about this? If we acknowledge to ourselves that this is right for us, this kind of, of plan that could reap rewards uh, very late in life, when do we start and how do we start? Yeah, well, so let's first start with the who. So this type of product is really designed for somebody who's in their 50s to early 70s, who's living a healthy lifestyle and sort of aspires to that longevity that, you know, so so core to this this podcast. And that's really the, 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 the target audience. In terms of the process, it's very easy. It's, uh, it's just a website. You go to the website, uh, ageup, age-up.com. The product is underwritten by Mass Mutual, uh, which is one of the largest and most respected insurance carriers. And the sign-up process takes all of about five minutes. You enter in your bank account information, and then every month, a little bit of money. Your choice how much, between $25 and $250, gets contributed into this longevity annuity. And then that's it. You uh, you focus on uh, living your healthy lifestyle and doing everything you can to live as long as possible. And so let's assume someone's starting in their 50s. How long do they pay into it? In other words, when do they stop paying before they can get the income at a later age? They can start or stop whenever they like, uh, which is one of the beauties of the product. Um, so you can start in your 50s, putting $25 a month in, and then you can decide maybe there's a change in your lifestyle or, or your health where you no longer want to contribute it, and you can stop at any time. Any amount of money that you've put in at the time that you put in converts into a little slice of future income. So, Peter, think of it this way. Whenever you put in your, say, $50 into this longevity annuity, when you make that contribution, that converts into a little slice of income that may not start until you're 95 or 100, but then it will go on for as long as you're living. And so every monthly payment you made in the past is one little slice of future income in the future. And you can stop making those monthly payments at any time. What a lot of people might be concerned about when they hear us talking about getting to 90, 100 years old, 110 years old, and clearly for regular listeners to this podcast, when we talk about health issues and science, it's an aspiration to have as long a health span as possible. That is the the longest uh, time when we're active and involved and, and social and b being able to do things physically. But clearly, reality dawns and things sometimes impact us that we have absolutely no control over at all. And we might not last that long. We might get to 75, 80, 85. And the question clearly arises, if you're getting into some sort of plan that will provide an income for you in your 90s, mm -hmm. but you don't actually reach that age, are you wasting your time? Peter, that's a great question and one that actually sheds light on how the product works and gives us a way to talk about a few theoretical examples. So in our quest to make a really simple online product, we reduce the number of decisions a customer faces down to just two basic choices. The first choice, if you die before your 90s, do you want the money you paid in to go to your beneficiaries? Now, if you weren't presented with an alternative, most people would just say yes without blinking. But in this case, it's important to remember that if you opt out of returning the money that you put in uh, to an age-up plan to your beneficiaries, you know, in the event that you pass before your 90s, the payout is actually much larger. And, you know, some people are going to be more interested in a lower risk, lower reward uh, protection uh, product, but others might be interested in the exact opposite. You know, as for the second choice, this relates to what age you select your age up annuity to convert into guaranteed monthly income. Uh, age 91 is the earliest and age 100 is the latest. Now, the longer you delay, the higher the payout. Uh, and this is because essentially those who pass early fund the payout pot for those who go, on, who go on to live very long lives. So let's sort of combine these two decision points into the case of a 65-year-old man putting $50 a month into age up. Uh, and in the first case, let's just imagine that he chooses his 91st birthday as the date for when the product converts into guaranteed monthly income. In in this scenario, you know, if he opted to return whatever money he put in to his beneficiaries, in case he 
passes before his 91st birthday, uh, he would receive about $450 per month. This amount uh, almost doubles to about $850 per month if he waives that that option. And so now let's look at the other extreme. What if that same 65-year-old man putting $50 a month into age up picks age 100, his 100th birthday, as the trigger point for when the product annuitizes? Now, in this case, uh, if he you know, was the picks the more conservative option of having the money get returned to his beneficiaries if he passes before his 100th birthday, uh, his monthly payout would be $5,000 of guaranteed income per month. Now, if he waived that right, though, that monthly payout shoots up to $14,000 of guaranteed monthly income. And so what you see here is really, really radically different payout options based on individual preferences for risk and reward. So a lot of this actually goes to the mindset of people, doesn't it? And and people in midlife, in their 50s and 60s, in terms of how they see themselves and their chances of getting to a very old age. And, and everyone views that in a rather different way. And maybe listening to this podcast are rather more gung-ho and, and positive in that respect because they are let's say, trying to live the the life, the longevity lifestyle to get to that great age. But it does depend on your own certainty to some extent about how old you're going to get. You know, it's true, Peter. And we actually did quite a bit of survey work on this topic to really understand uh, uh, sort of the average expectations around longevity. And what's really interesting, we asked a, a question in a number of ways to a number of different populations of people. Essentially, you know, what do you think your chances are that you will live to age 100? And what was really interesting was that, you know, 12% of essentially baby boomers said that they have a real chance of living to age 100. Now, we paired that question with, you know, do you think you'll have the financial resources to actually make it to age 100? And there's a huge gap there. Because in the one hand, you see a significant number of people saying that there's a realistic chance that they could live to 100. And then you see more people saying that they will not have the resources to live to 100. And we also pair this with questions like the available expectations around Social Security in 30 years. It's actually a sort of a split audience there. About half of people think that Social Security will be around, half don't. And then the ability of the younger generation to support people that are living to, to age 100. And in that case also, uh, although we, we found that many people who expect to live to age 100 expect their family to support them, there are some signs in the survey data when we asked the younger generation whether they think they could support their parents that that, that may not be the case. Um, and that spells uh, you know, the, the potential for real financial distress for folks. And we should say when you mention Social Security that this is available only in the United States. Correct. This is only in the United States. Now, as you've already mentioned, AGEP is backed by Mass Mutual. How significant is that? I imagine very significant to people to know that there is a, an element of security and, and longevity in the company that is backing this product. Absolutely. Because if you think about it, this is a promise that the insurance carrier is making that may, uh, the promise may not be called for 50 years. And so you want to make sure that the carrier that you are working with is going to be here in 50 years. How, in the case of Mass Mutual, that's 170 years old. So it survived the, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, everything in between, and quite literally has the same credit rating as the U.S. government in terms of its financial stability. So this is a, a carrier that, that is trusted and that has really stood the test of time. But it's a, it's a great point because it would be awful if you purchased a longevity product and then the carrier that you purchased it from wasn't around when you went to collect. And so hence having very good backing it matters a lot. And I think that question may be more uppermost in, in people's minds today than, than ever before because of the uncertain times that we're living through uh, with coronavirus yes. and the, the lockdowns and people being made unemployed and, and companies going out of business. They, people are going to look twice and three times at, at any entity that they get involved with that uh, makes a promise about the future. You know, actually, Peter, can I pick up on a thread that you mentioned with uh, with coronavirus? Um, 
When we went to launch this product uh, a few months ago, it was right in the height of coronavirus. And, and we were frankly a little nervous about the brand implications of, of, of marketing longevity insurance, which this effectively is, in a time when people are so focused on, on mortality. Yeah. And so again, we sort of went back to the survey drawing board, if you will, and, and did quite a bit of customer research. And what we found was, was pretty fascinating is that in the, the present day, people really are severely impacted by, by COVID. And, and they're very clear about that. What's interesting, though, is when you ask them to imagine the world in 30 years, and specifically, I'm talking about people in their 60s, late 50s, early 70s. So people who are going to be in their, their 90s and, and 100s, their expectations of the world in 100 years and their own longevity are in, in 30 years, it's remarkably stable. We ran two surveys, one right before uh, sort of COVID started spiking and one mid-COVID. And there was almost no difference in the long-term perceptions of, of longevity, although the short-term reality of impact on day-to-day -day life was, was very, very different. It's fascinating you say that because I had the same thought process back in March and April relating to this podcast. We talk about longevity, living to a, a great age. At the time, people were concerned about living till next month and their the loved ones as well. And it was more of a survival mode, I think, that most of us went into. But then as time passed, there was a realization that what we do every day as far as our exercise and, and diet is concerned is key to surviving something like coronavirus and that the most healthy amongst us, less obese, physically active and more able it seems, to fight this virus. And, and therefore, exactly as you've said, that longevity ideas and, and perceptions may be remolded and, and reframed in our minds, but uh, they stay the same in terms of, of long-term goals. And we kind of get over that hump of worrying about just getting through till tomorrow or, or next week. And there's a realization that what we do now impacts the very, very long term. Absolutely. And stepping back from just the age up example, uh, there's been a lot of research that in times like these, things like saving rates and preparedness for the future actually go up versus down. And on the surface, you would expect sort of a, almost a more of a fatalistic approach that that point that you just made about sort of uh, making it, you know, tomorrow. But that's actually not the reality. People's behaviors are very, very different. Um, and they tend to actually save more and focus more on the future in these difficult times. Yeah. And again, there's a correlation there. People are saving more, thinking about the future. From a health perspective, people are being cleaner. They're washing their hands. They're doing those obvious things that we should perhaps have done more of to avoid the common cold. We're now doing it to avoid coronavirus. And that we are more acutely aware of those things that we can do to protect ourselves into the future. It's fascinating to me that this correlation that I, honestly I hadn't thought about before in terms of our financial futures can be compared with our physical and, and health futures. Exactly, yes. The other thing that interests me about what you're doing, and you, and you referred to it, there's nothing quite like this. You are, there's that word, disrupting, disrupting the system, aren't you? I, I'm wondering from a personal perspective, what is your drive? What's your motivation, knowing what you do about finance to disrupt the system? So I think there's, there's two answers to that, Peter. The, the first is, by nature, I'm just intellectually curious. And when I st stumbled on this longevity issue, it was just fascinating. And I really wanted, first, just to, to build a product that, that solved for real longevity risk. And that's more just a personal disposition. But on the personal side, other than personal disposition, I grew up very close to my grandparents on uh, on my father's side, and both of them were lucky enough to live into their late nineties. And I was sort of along the, the journey the whole way. And you know, the the last few years get very, very expensive. And so when we started working on this concept, it had real emotional resonance to me because I could think back just a few years when I was going through and living this with with my aging grandparents. And sort of playing the hypothetical, like, what if, well, what if we did have, you know, an extra, you know, $5,000 a month to help support them uh, in, in their older years? And so the, the work just became all the more personal uh, and meaningful. And I'm wondering, from what you've learned, not only from the finance world, but while you've been delving into longevity, and this is a question I often ask people on this podcast about what you've learned and how you maybe apply it to yourself 
with your own lifestyle and your own perspective about living a long, healthy life. I use the phrase repeatedly, health span, as opposed to lifespan. And, and health span is still new to a lot of people. The concept that we can be agile and vital and intellectually curious and involved to a very, very old age, as opposed to just living to a very old age and the heart beating, but perhaps not being physically able to do much, that health span is the main focus. And I'm wondering, from what you've learned about perhaps both industries, the, the health span industry, if you like, and, and finance as well, do you have a different perspective yourself about growing old? And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. To be honest, my perspective is is pretty much unchanged in that I knew that healthy lifestyle and healthy living were were important before intellectually. But now that I'm working in this space, I feel that on an emotional level is something that I should pay more attention to in terms of my own physical health and well-being, things like uh, stress levels and diet. Uh, and it really has brought home um, sort of lifestyle issues. So, yes, I feel it now in addition to intellectually understanding it before. Has uh, COVID changed your day-to-day -day lifestyle? Clearly, it's changed all of us in, in terms of the way that we communicate with each other. But are there other aspects of COVID that have made you rethink how you live your life every day? Well, uh, on the positive side, you know, COVID has, uh, we have a, a four-year-old and a six-month-old. And the six-month-old was born March 12th. So the absolute peak of uh, COVID, at least it, we're in Boston, and that's where when Boston was going through, you know, quite a, quite a scare. And the result of this is we've had actually a lot of glorious family time. And so the, the benefit of COVID is, is really bringing to the forefront the importance of, of family time, because we're all now all in it together. And we we physically don't see other people and we just spend a lot more time together and it's, and it's been wonderful. So that sort of return to uh, almost a simpler time is, is actually a very good thing. Uh, and I think will cause a lot of people, myself included, to really question future sort of work patterns. It's interesting you mentioned children. Almost everyone I interview for the podcast uh, when we talk about the, the motivation to, to live long and healthy almost everyone mentions their children as a reason to want to stay as healthy as possible, as, as old as they get. So they can be around for their children, to share in their children's lives, perhaps share some of their wisdom with their children. And this, this in some senses, goes right to the heart of, of what we're talking about in, in your product, because children are crucially involved in the decisions of, of their parents as they get to a very, very old age. And you, you can see, as you just nicely described, you can see that family bond, if you like, taking yourself through your life right to the very end. That's a great point, Peter. You, you know, when we designed this product, we actually designed it for two different use cases, if you will, in mind. One use case is for people who are in their 50s, 60s and early 70s to essentially insure themselves for their own longevity risk. But the second use case and the one that we actually launched first in the market was something very different, and it was aimed for millennials and sort of younger Gen X people who have baby boomer parents and who realize that their parents have real longevity risk and their parents may not have the finances to match basically their financial needs with their longevity. And so we, we created that use case so people in their 30s and 40s could buy this very low-cost financial product to support their parents should their parents live that sort of happy path of life into their 90s and beyond and really focus on that intergenerational aspect of, uh, in your point, sort of everybody sort of going together with it. It's been interesting because we got to essentially play with both sides of the same coin uh, with the same product design. And you mentioned that you started the major part of the launch of this was at the height of COVID. And, and that's when you were thinking about it and beginning to promote it and perhaps reframing your ideas in terms of how you could promote it. I'm wondering now, as we're getting towards the end of the year, how's it going? So it's interesting. When we launched it with COVID, we, 
we almost didn't want to use the word longevity or long life again because it felt so charged back in the spring with with the height of covid and so as a result a lot of our advertisements were frankly more in the language of annuities talking about guaranteed income and things like that we found that that really didn't work and what we are now going to is where we started which is actually focusing on healthy lifestyles and people who aspire to live into their hundreds and beyond. And so over the last six or seven months, our own messaging and marketing has really, really evolved to where it should have been in the start, which was focusing on on the longevity piece. We just wanted to be very sensitive when we first launched because it was such a difficult time. And I'm wondering, this thought just occurred to me, I'm wondering if someone who enters into this kind of plan as they're getting older and uh, we can only imagine and guess what it's like to be in our 80s, approaching our 90s in terms of our mindset. But knowing that we have this potential income to come, I wonder how, maybe neither of us can answer this question, but I wonder how it will affect our mindset as we're in those years just before getting the money, if you like, or yeah. getting the, that income. And I ask that because one of the common traits that I've seen in terms of very, very old people just keeping going and keeping going from the next month to the next year to the next year, it's sometimes because they've got something to look forward to. And families are a big part of arranging things for older people. It could be a, a party, it could be an event, it could be a book club, it could be a conversation over coffee with your best friend. But it's always something happening Tomorrow, pets come into this as well. People mm -hmm. feel as if they've got something to live for because they've got their pet. And there's a psychological element of just keeping going because you're always looking forward. And, and I'm just wondering if this could play into that. I think it absolutely, absolutely could. I, I think the other dimension here is that worries about money and finances are intricately linked with stress and anxiety. And so if you have fewer worries about money and finances, especially when you imagine the future state, that can only help lower your levels of, of anxiety and can only sort of correlate to more healthy, healthy lifestyle, essentially, uh, and a better chance of, of, of living a very long life. And I'll also add that, you know, we, we, we did a lot of uh, interesting survey work, again, around beliefs around what it would like to be, what it would be like to live to 100. And the top concerns were after sort of losing the physical and mental, mental sort of mobility and capacity, were actually around finances, not having enough money, and not becoming a burden. And so this product also helps people not become a burden. And it actually relieves the anxiety of that as a potential sort of future state, which again can only help people on that longevity march. And I think that's a, a nice way to end this because you very effectively, I think, sum up the motivation to do that. Blair, this has been a really fascinating conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you, Peter, so much. And I know that financial matters can be complicated and, and difficult to digest, and I struggle as much as anyone. If you would like more information about Age Up, to dive a little deeper into the subject, go to age-up.com. You'll find a lot of detail there, and you'll find the website details in the show notes for this episode at our website, that's llamapodcast.com, double L-A-M-A podcast.com. A reminder that you can now listen to us on multiple podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and now we're also available at Amazon Music Podcasts. Just go to their site, music.amazon.com slash podcasts, or download the app and you'll find us in their directory. Just search for Live Long and Master Aging. The Llama Podcast is a HealthSpan Media production. If you enjoy what we do, you can rate and review us at Apple Podcast. You can follow us in social media at Llama Podcast and direct message me at Peter Bowes. It's always great to hear from you. Many thanks for listening. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.